Turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. We'll get there in just a moment. Matthew chapter 12. There is a place that I found in the mountains uh, that I discovered online. I didn't go there yet. My wife would be very upset. But uh, there is a place in the mountains of Switzerland where you can actually throw a piece of wood in three different directions. All right, Pastor Randy, that's pretty crazy because you can throw wood in any direction you want to. But in Switzerland, standing on this mountain, you can throw a piece of wood in three different directions. If you throw it in one direction, it will float down to what's called the Danube River. It will go to the Black Sea. If you throw it in another direction, it will go into the Rhine River, and it will end up in the North Sea. And if you throw it from a third location, uh, in a third direction, it will go to the Rhone River, and it will end up in the Mediterranean Sea. It is the same piece of wood, the same piece of wood from the same spot, but ending up in three different directions. They end up miles apart from each other. Their final destination is determined by which direction they are originally thrown. So if you've got, let me get this because that's, a, even for me, that's a little low. Praise God. Are we good? Oh, we're good. I'm just having a little conversation with myself. Don't worry. I'll come back to you. God bless. The final destination is always determined by the direction that you're moving, that you choose to go in, intentionally or not. Life is like that as well. We will be tomorrow what we've determined today to make ourselves. So today matters. Today matters. It's true. What you decide determines where you end up. It was true for them. It's true for Jesus, and it's true for us. Jesus made choices. Every day he made choices, and his character revealed, and the choices revealed his character. So as he made these choices, the truth of who he was came out. You can only hide it from so long. You can only, you can only cover it up for so long. Your choices will reveal who you really are and what you really believe and where you end up. Jesus chose to do some things, and yes, here's what gripped me. He also refused to do a few things. He chose to do a lot of things, but there were some things he refused to do. His choices in life determined his final destination. So let's take a quick look. The gospel reveals some things that Jesus was willing to do. What was Jesus willing to do? Well, a few things. He was willing to raise Lazarus from the dead. That's pretty powerful. Now, he delayed a couple days, but he was willing to, to raise Lazarus from the dead. He willingly healed blind Bartimaeus. What do you want? I want to see. Well, okay. He willingly healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law. She was sick. She was down. They asked for healing. He willingly did it. He willingly fed the hungry, released the oppressed, and encouraged the depressed all the time. As you read through the Gospels, you will see Jesus was willing to do a lot of stuff. But there's another side to his ministry, and this is where we'll focus for a few moments today. He refused to do some things on this earth, and he still refuses to do them today. One passage in Matthew reveals how some of those things actually transpire. So that's Matthew chapter 12. We're going to get there. We're going to read it in just a moment, but let me set it up. In the bigger context of Matthew chapter 12, you're seeing the whole story. You're not just reading one little passage. You're seeing how it fits together, chapter 12. Jesus is not only challenging the rules and the purpose of the Sabbath. They're talking about what you can and cannot do on Sunday, what you can and cannot do on the holy day, if you want to look at it as that. And they were looking at the law, and they were looking at the rules, and they said there were rules, and there was a purpose to the Sabbath. And Jesus shows up and says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I can do whatever I want. He basically is saying the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And he's trying to help them understand that he has authority. He's revealing that he has authority. And then he goes into the temple, and some scholars say that they position this man just like they did the woman caught in adultery to try to trap Jesus. So they put a man in the temple, and he has a withered arm. Will Jesus heal him? Will Jesus not heal him? Jesus is willing to do anything. Jesus, will, will he refuse? Will he? And Jesus willingly heals the man with the withered hand. And it's really awesome because this guy stretches out his arm. And Je if you read the story, Jesus didn't tell him which arm to stretch out. He just said, stretch out your arm. And a lot of us, we want to give what's good, but this guy stretched out what was bad. God's saying to you today, maybe, listen, give me what's bad. Give me what you don't. Give me what you think is withered. Give me what you think is broken. Give me what you think I don't want because I, he didn't just heal a hand. He restored a hand. Amen. So he's revealing his authority about the Sabbath. He's revealing his power that he can heal on the Sabbath. And 
the guy was put there to trap him, but I love that Jesus refused to be trapped by the religious leaders. He refused to be trapped by them. He saw through their masquerade. He knew what they were trying to do. And then I also see that he refused to neglect or to reject this man that was in front of him or the opportunity. That's good news, amen? Because you're thinking to yourself, he doesn't know where I'm at. He doesn't care where I'm at. He doesn't care what I'm going through. He has no idea. God will, listen, Jesus is willing. He will not reject or neglect you, amen? There might be a delay sometimes, but he will not reject or neglect you. In verse 13, he tells the man to stretch out his hand and he healed him. And it stirs up all the religious leaders, all right? So they get really upset. And they're trying to figure out what, and they're deciding what they're going to do. But in this passage, a couple of uh, verses down, we're also going to see what Jesus refuses to do. All right, so let's get to Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to start in verse 14. I do that for my friend Adam, who doesn't like the page breaks in there. Amen. Some of you that know him. The little title. That's so good for many of us. We're like, oh, it's about this. But there's context to what's going on. Verse 14. Jesus knew his purpose. Listen. But the Pharisees went out and they conspired against him how to destroy him. Listen, if you're standing up for Jesus and the enemy is looking for how to destroy you, you're in good company, all right? Keep standing firm for Christ. So the enemy is looking, the Pharisees are looking for a way to destroy him. Verse 15 says, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. So he's fulfilling prophecy now, and Matthew tells us this, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. You're basically saying they're not gonna recognize him. They're not gonna realize. They're not gonna understand. They're not gonna, they're not gonna get what he's trying to do. He seems silent. Didn't even seem like he made a big deal about it. A bruised reed, verse 20, he will not break. And a smoldering wick, he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope, will hope. Then it goes in to another demonstration of his power and, and, and what God is doing in and through him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And as, as important as it is to know what you're willing to do, it's also important for us to know what you refuse to do. And God, I'm going to give them a couple of them today and challenge them to, to find the others on their own. Lord, I'm asking you to minister and to be encouraged and to encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus knows his purpose, and he uses with the disciples Isaiah 42, Isaiah 11, and Isaiah 61 to reveal who he is and what he refuses to do. He says, a, sm uh, a, a, a broken reed he will not break, he will not crush, and a smoldering wick he won't put out. Listen, the mission and the heartbeat of Jesus is way more important than being popular or the approval of other people. He knew what to do and he knew what not to do. A lot of us would do well to learn that, to know what to do and what not to do. The first thing that Jesus knew or refused was he refused to be impatient with sinners. He refuses to be impatient with sinners. He is humble. He is gracious. One theologian said it like this, if I were God and the world treated me the way it treated him, I would have destroyed them long ago. I kind of understand that, but that's not how Jesus is. He is merciful. He is patient with sinners. When the adulterous woman, uh, about a month ago, when I got to preach about beholding the beauty of Jesus, and I talked about the adulterous woman who was brought to Jesus, he didn't throw a stone at her. He had every right to throw the stone, but he gave her divine patience. Maybe you are living today on some divine patience right now. You haven't gotten what you deserved. You know why? Because God is gracious, slow to anger, compassionate, abounding in love. And we'll get to that scripture in just a moment. Was the woman guilty? Absolutely guilty. But was he forgiving and patient with her? Yes, he's patient. That's John chapter 8. When Peter failed Jesus, when he failed and he denied Christ, 
which many scholars say was even worse than what Judas did. But he, he not only did not, he did not only failed Christ, he denied his rabbi, denied his teacher. I mean, basically, like a prodigal walking away, considered him dead, just walked. Jesus gave him another opportunity. You can read that in John chapter 21. Jesus shows up on the shoreline, and Peter is, is just gloriously restored. Jesus is patient. He quotes from Isaiah. Now, I want you to understand, Isaiah is talking to the children of Israel, all right? And Jesus is dealing with the religious folks. So they're similar in nature. He's talking to the children of Israel. He's talking to the religious leaders who are the children of God. And their message is essentially the same. I refuse to neglect. I refuse to reject the people. There is going to be a hope. If you read in Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 11, he, uh, Isaiah is telling the children of God, you are going through a difficult time. You are facing a struggle. You are having, you are going through hardships, but understand, I will not reject you. I will not neglect you forever. I will send a deliverer and you will be set free. He's basically saying, I refuse to be impatient with you. I am still going to give you a way out. Isaiah 42, 3 says, a bruised reed he shall not break. What does that mean? A bruised reed, if you step on it and you give it a heavy load, a little, you know, you've seen it out there blowing in the wind, and you, you crack it, it's down, it's crushed, it's over. It's no longer can serve that purpose that it was designed for. It's bruised, it's almost broken, the slightest wind could touch or finish it off, and this is the heartbeat of, G of God. I will not break that bruised reed. He's not going to finish you off. Just finish me off, God. Just be done with me. This is just too much. God says, no, there's, there's a way back. He has every right to crush the, the, the reed, but he doesn't. And here was my thought. We've all been bruised by the heavy load of life. We've all been bruised, stepped on, the hurts, the heartaches, the things that hold us back. We get a cancer report, we get in a car accident, or something happens at work, and it just crushes us when you least expect it. And you feel like, that's it, it's over. But Jesus says, I'm patient. I'm not going to finish you off. I'm not going to let the enemy finish you off. Matthew reminded us of the gentleness of Jesus, a Savior who refuses to be impatient. The scripture I was alluding to earlier, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. Oh. You know, I've, I've used the, the line, you know, God's never late, we know that, but he's missed a, a whole lot of opportunities to show up earlier and really set my heart at ease. But he's always on time. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but is patient, patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Now, perish, if you look that word up, I always thought it just meant die. You won't die. Listen, Scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Nobody gets out of this life without dying or the rapture. So the bottom line is, is he wasn't saying that you won't die, like physically die. That word perish, if you look it up, it means lost, ruined, destroyed, or separated. So let's read it a little differently. But is patient toward you, not wishing that any should be lost or ruined or destroyed or separated from him, but should reach repentance. Jesus refuses to be impatient with you. He's patient with us right now. No matter what we've done, no matter where you're at, bound by alcohol, hooked on drugs, sexual immorality, adultery, lying, whatever it might be, Jesus knows it and he loves you anyway. He doesn't say keep on sinning. He does not want you to continue to sin, but he patiently waits for us to repent and to be reconciled with him. It's our choice. Second thing Jesus refuses to do is he refuses to discourage, discourage those who are weary, weary. He refuses to discourage those who are weary. Jesus is the great encourager, not the great discourager. He won't finish us off. He won't hit you while you're down. Jesus is known for saying, don't be afraid. Fear not. It is I. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. 
I was reading uh, some of that scripture that Gabby was bringing right at the beginning, and, and it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Peace is there. You've got to let it flow. You've got to let it, you've got to welcome it and let it flow. Matthew paints a very visual picture of Jesus and his refusal to discourage the weary. He says this, smoking flax, he will not quench. Yeah, that's real comforting, Pastor Andy. Thank you for that. that I'll, I'll put, write that down, put it under my pillow. I will be so comforted tonight. Let me explain. First century people lit their homes with a linen wick. They soaked it in olive oil. And the only time it would smoke was when it was almost out of oil. The smoke revealed a struggle to survive. The slightest breath would put out the light. Many of us have gotten to that point in our faith, haven't we? Where we're running out of oil, we're weary, we're, we, we've done well, we've, we've shined and, and we've shared and we've served and we've suffered for Jesus in some different ways and we're just like, that's it, I've had enough and we're, we're, it's, it's over, it's about to go out. The flickering light says, you're overwhelmed with life's burdens and you're about to get snuffed out. It's about to go out, no more oil. And I thought about Jairus. Jairus is one of the synagogue leaders. And in Mark chapter 5, you can read about him. Jairus was a religious leader, and so he had every right to come against Jesus and to join the crowd and to grab the stones and to throw the rocks and to do all the stuff. But he put aside his fear, he put aside his pride, and he went to Jesus. Why? Because he had a need. He had a need. His daughter was dying. His daughter was sick, and he wanted Jesus to heal his daughter. So he goes and he gets Jesus, and Jesus says, I'll go with you. I'll go to your house. I'm going to take care of this. And, he inter and, and on the way, he is interrupted by everybody else's needs. And this lady presses through the crowd, and she grabs his cloak, and Jesus stops, and the whole, the whole entourage stops, and he wants to know who touched me, and he goes, and, he, and Jairus is watching all this, and he's amazed at what God's doing, and, and, and she's been healed. And finally, he's relieved, and they're heading back to the house. Okay, so let's get on to my house. My daughter is sick, and we've got to get there. But on the way, some people show up, and they say, Jairus, don't bother the father. Don't bother the, the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. There's nothing he can do. It's all over. Uh, just let him go home. Don't, and in fact, he says, don't trouble the master. And Jesus says this, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. In one version, it says, and she will be healed. He looks at Jairus, Mark chapter 5. While he was speaking, there came from them the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing, I like that, just like he did with, uh, um, with coming in the temple where he said he was aware that they wanted to, to, to destroy him. They wanted to do that. He said he overheard what they were saying, verse 36. What they said to Jesus, to the ruler of the synagogue, but Jesus said this, do not fear, only believe. I can tell you real quickly that after my first wife passed away, I wanted to quit and I wanted to be done. I never said I'd give up on God. I just didn't want to be a pastor anymore and I didn't want to work in the church. And I just figured who would want me to pray for them if I prayed for my wife and she died. So, you know, I just had that logic. And uh, I remember reading this scripture I took some young people on a mission trip not long after, and I was getting, you know, preparing my way to, to quit and to do all that kind of stuff. And uh, I read this passage where God, where Jesus said, do not fear, only believe. Just believe, Randy. You can't see what's next, but I can. I can. I, he does not, he does not discourage the weary. He encourages us. Many are discouraged by life, but notice that Jesus refuses to kick you while you're down. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, this is his words. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened or weighed down, and I will give you rest. The issue is not the call. Jesus has said, come. The question is, are you coming to him? You know that, that he'll give you rest, but have you come to him? The smoldering wicks are often believers who are running out of oil. They're tired, they're weary. Maybe you're not reading your Bible as much. Maybe you're not worshiping as much. Maybe you're not serving as much. Maybe you're not giving as much. Maybe you're not sharing your faith. Maybe you're not being obedient. Maybe you've just hit a rough time. You're tired and you just, you're, you've pulled back. And many of us are living on the fumes of religion and it's time to refuel, amen? It's time to refuel. Pastor Jason talked a couple of weeks ago about the oil of intimacy. 
and, and how they, they trimmed the wick and they trimmed the wick as it was burning. But don't let it get to where you have no oil to burn. You will definitely go out. Jesus could have put them out, but he didn't. We need to take time in prayer, time in worship, time in serving, trusting, surrendering, and let God fill us up. And then the last thing Jesus refuses to do. Jesus refuses to go in where he's not invited. He refuses to go in where he's not invited. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. Amen. I'm going to invite them to come back. It's amazing what we'll allow in our homes. We would not let a drug deal go down in our living room. We would not let a prostitute into our bedroom. We would not let somebody cuss us out or steal from us in our own home. And yet we do it all the time by what we let in through the TVs and the movies and the music and the social media and the books that we read, all these things, we become a gate that opens up and we knowingly or unknowingly invite these things, these spirits, these attacks, these influences, these words into our world. We in we invite all kinds of things and don't even realize what we're doing. We open the door to everything except Jesus. And Jesus says, well, he knows I'm there. If he wants to come in, he can come in. No, no. Jesus refuses to enter, or excuse me, to go in where he's not invited. He's not an intruder. He's not an interloper. He's not, he's not going to forcefully take over your heart and your life. If you want Christ and the joy that he brings, you have to invite him in. And guys, this is what's important. I know I'm talking to a lot of believers today. It's not just have you made him the Lord of your life once, but is he the Lord of your life today? Is he the Lord of your finances? Is he the Lord of your emotions? Guys, I had plenty of opportunities over the last week to have an attitude, to get angry, to get upset, to have an opinion, to fight back, to fire back, to be critical, to say all kinds of things. But I get to choose what I'm going to do and what I'm going to let in. His blessings are available to those who will activate him, activate them. Here's a question. Is Jesus your first thought or your last resort? I've heard Pastor Jason bring that up before. Is he your, is he your, your first thought or is he your last resort? Thank God, even if he's your last resort today, he's still, he still wants in. Amen? Knowing there's a million dollars in your bank is not the same thing as using a million dollars. You can know that, that your bank is full of money, but if you never use it, what's the point? We'd have no problem spending that money, but we do have a problem asking Jesus for help. Come on, Jesus. Ah, well, if he wants to show up, he will. No, Revelations 3.20 says this, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If any man or any woman hears my voice, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Sitting at someone's table back then was huge. It was hospitality. It was a big, big deal to be invited home and to somebody's personal table. And Jesus is saying, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If you open that door and you invite me in, I'll come in. If not, I'll be outside. Many preachers through the years have pointed out that the knob is not on the inside, on the outside, it's on the inside of the door. He's not going to intrude. He's not going to, to force his way in. He's waiting on us, and he's knocking on the door of your life. And many have already let him in. Look at Scripture, Martha, you know, Martha and Mary, John the Baptist, the disciples. You can think of so many people that have invited him. We see their story, but do you realize that on the pages in the book of life right now, your story is being written? And one day, we're going to read it. We're going to know. Did you invite him in? Did you not invite him in? Did you give your life to him? Did you not? Were you following him? Were you not? Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life get to enjoy and, to, and enjoy eternity with him forever. One day the door will close. That's a heavy statement, but it's true. But right now, the door's wide open. I alluded to it earlier, so I'll conclude with it here. King David had everything a person could want, everything a person could need. 
And he said in Psalm 27, one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What does it mean to inquire in his temple? It means to meditate, to consider, and to appreciate the presence of God and who he is. David says, I've got everything you could want, but the one thing I want is his presence all the time. It's an interesting concept, don't you think, what Jesus refuses to do? I'm going to stop here, but I wanted to give you some food for thought. Jesus refuses to stop loving you. Jesus refuses to stop interceding for you and praying for you. Jesus refuses to stop trying to reach you. He will keep reaching you, even through a fumbled up message from an old guy in cool shoes. He refuses to take back his offer. Jesus is not an Indian giver. I was with my granddaughter this week. It was awesome. She would hold out something for me, and I would grab it, and she'd take it back. And she'd hold it, and she'd take it back. She would walk. She hasn't quite got the knee-bending thing yet, so it was a really cute walk, kind of. But she had figured out how to lead with her hand, so you look like she's coming after you, and then she turns. That was really cute when my granddaughter and me was doing it, but I would be very disgusted if that's how Jesus was. And Jesus refuses to, refuses to take back his offer. He has offered us freedom and victory and forgiveness and hope and love and peace, and the offer still stands. I love this one. As disciples of Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus, he refuses to treat you as your sins deserve. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus refuses to throw your sin in your face back at you. I've had a few arguments with a few people that will remain nameless. And we've brought up some past things. We've thrown them back. Well, you did this and you did that. Well, you went here. Well, how could you do that? Da, da, da. But Jesus never throws it back. You want a really good psalm to read? Psalm 103, Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, our sins from us. He doesn't remember them anymore. Hey, God, you remember when I did that? If you've asked him to forgive you, his answer is no. No, it's under the blood. How about this? He refuses to force you to serve him or take away your free will. That's a painful one because I... If I could be saved for a few people, I don't know about you, you have a list of people that if you could be saved for them, you'd do it. You thought of them right now. If your list isn't long, it's okay, neither is mine. <laughs> but there are a few, you'll get that later, right? But there are a few people that if I could be saved for them, I would do it. But he can't do that for us. He won't do that for us. We've got to want him. He, it's got to be our choice. He refuses to let convenient Christianity be the norm. He's going to stir it up. You know what he does? He uses a worship leader. He uses a pastor like our pastor. He uses a friend. He uses social media. He'll do whatever he has to to stir you up. Gabby was talking about sometimes you got to stir that up. That's what, he, that's what Paul told Timothy. Stir up the gift, bro. Sometimes you got to stir that up. Fan the flame. Because Jesus refuses to let convenient Christianity be the norm. I like to call him, he's not, it's not hokey pokey Christianity with one foot in and one foot out. Jesus refuses to lie, to cheat, and to steal from you. He refuses to lie, cheat, and steal from you. If he tells you it's the truth, it's the truth, he can't lie. But he will ask you to climb some mountains. He will ask you to walk through some valleys. And he will ask you to trust him through it all. I look around the room and many that I do know, some I might not know as well, but the ones I'm seeing I do know, you've walked through some fire. But he walked through it with you. He refuses to let you go alone. Jesus said this, I have to die. There's a victory coming your way. And if I die, then guess what? The same Holy Spirit that filled me 
will now be released and can fill you. And you will never go anywhere without my presence. He said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. He refuses to leave us alone at this point. But a day will come when it will happen. So what are you dealing with today? What condition is your relationship in? Are you a broken reed? You've been broken by life? Let's come to Jesus. Are you a, how we say it, smoking flax? Are you burning out? Do you need some oil? Stand with me today and we'll pray. I love to know what Jesus is willing to do. But yesterday and today, what gripped my heart was knowing what he refuses to do. He refuses to let you go one more day without another invitation to trust him. Bow your heads. Father, we love you. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word this day, this Sunday after Thanksgiving. We give you thanks. We thank you for your presence that has filled our hearts and filled this place. We thank you for the victories and the miracles that have gone out and that will be realized this week because we claim them and we're standing on your promises. But even now, God, we talk to those who are broken and we talk to those, God, who are feel like they're run, they've run out of oil and they're at the end. We're asking you to strengthen them, God to refuel and to fill them up. Lord, if they need to make you the Lord of their life, that they would do that right now. All you've got to do if you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life or the Lord of that situation that you're dealing with, that worry, that struggle, that difficulty, that meeting that's coming, that doctor's visit, I'm going to tell you all you've got to do is say the name of Jesus. Say the name of Jesus. Say the name of Jesus. Mean it in your heart and know that he cannot refuse you when you invite him. In. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open that door, I'll come in. Father, we love you. And we're going to worship you and we're going to give you glory and we're going to praise you before we leave. We're going to seal this time, God, in the victories that you've given us. And we give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And praise God. Let's worship him this morning.